John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is John's testimony. There is someone who's coming after me who is going to be the one, the chosen one. John knew that he was sort of the last prophet who was going to proclaim the arrival of this chosen one. And now he sees Jesus coming to him. And Jesus comes to him and steps into the water and John says to Jesus, you come to me to be baptized, I should be baptized by you. This doesn't make sense. This, this isn't the way it should work. And Jesus says, no, you're going to baptize me. As if to say to John, you are the one who are, is going to inaugurate this amazing thing that is just about to happen. And he does. And when he comes out of the water, when Jesus comes out of the water, John sees a dove descending from heaven on Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit in the sort of form, visible form of a dove. And he hears this voice from heaven saying, this is my son. God himself, the Father in heaven says about Jesus, this is my son. And John gets to witness it all. He gets to see it all. But... Not too long after this, he gets thrown in prison. See, in Mark chapter 6, we read, Herod had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You see, John must have been going through an amazing mental transformation when he saw Jesus and knew that Jesus was the one, the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, because throughout Israel's history, from the earliest pages of Israel's history to the latest pages of Israel's history, the chosen one of God had always been someone who provided political freedom every single time without fail. You go all the way back to Moses, and here are the people, and they're in, in Egypt, and they're suffering, they're slaves in Egypt, and Moses comes along, and Moses says, okay, I'm going to free these people. God has spoken to me in the desert, and I'm gonna free these people. And he does some miraculous works that result in the freedom of these people politically. They leave Egypt with their freedom, and then they come to the new promised land, the land of Canaan, and while they're in the land of Canaan, now Joshua is their leader and they face opposition from these other nations there, and they defeat them one right after the other. And then after that period of time, they now have no leader. And so the foreign nations begin to infiltrate them religiously and politically, and God brings about a leader, and leader after leader does the same thing. He restores the nation to focus on God, and he frees them politically. It happens that way throughout the Old Testament, even to the point of the kings, when God gives Saul the first kingship and basically tells him, free my people from the Philistines. He can't do it, but David does. And so the, through the time of Israel's history, you see repeatedly one after the other, the chosen one of God is always bringing people back to God and freeing them politically. And now John, he has just seen Jesus the chosen one, the one about whom the Father in heaven boomed his voice and said, this is my chosen one. And so John, in utter fearlessness, looks Herod in the face and says, you sinner, you may be the king for now, but it will not last. You have taken your brother's wife as your own. You are a sinner and God will judge you. So there. And Herod says, all right, well, let's just see who's got the power. And he puts John in jail. And now John has to face this disillusionment. I thought Jesus was the chosen one. And Jesus has now spent a year, maybe two years, going around and he's teaching and he's bringing people back to God and he's doing miracles. But his cousin John, the greatest man who ever lived on the face of the earth, is now languishing in prison. And Jesus knows this and he allows this. 
And John, in his disillusionment and struggle and pain and frustration, finds himself at the lowest possible place. And it's in that low place where our, class, our questions tend to flourish. I know you've been there. I know you know exactly what John is going through because this is the journey of the Christian life. Every one of us has faced this. You come to a point in your life where you realize who Jesus is and you say, Jesus, I realize who you are and I want to live for you and I want to love you and I want to give you my life and I want you to give me eternal life and I want you to walk with me and guide me. And there's this sort of honeymoon period where everything seems to be great and we're fearless and we can tackle anything. But then along comes that point in our lives where Jesus doesn't meet our expectations the way we thought he would. And, and, and we enter a little tiny dip and, and maybe he doesn't meet our expectations when we're in that dip and we go to a deeper dip and, and maybe we just keep on going down until finally we find ourselves in a pit, in prison to our own disillusionment and disappointment and that's where the questions come out. And we ask ourselves, why am I here? I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was obeying God. I thought I was following him and no, it seems like I've missed something. Well, in John's response, we find four principles that I want to encourage you by to help you handle your questions in the best possible way. And the first one is this. I want to encourage you to ask the biggest question. I want to encourage you to ask the biggest questions. Don't bother with all these little tiny questions that you could be asking. Questions like uh, selfish questions. Jesus, John could be asking, Jesus, why are you letting me be in this prison? John could be saying, Jesus, you're supposed to be taking over the kingdom. Why don't you depose Herod? Jesus, why don't you oppose the Roman government directly to their face? Jesus, what are you doing with all these sinners when you could be spending time building an army to do the job that you're supposed to be doing as our king? He could have been asking any one of these kinds of questions that basically revolve around the fact that he should be free. And he could be asking those, but he doesn't. The question he asks is, are you the one? Let's see if I can unpack this a little bit. See, big questions are as much of a challenge to us as we are to them. When you ask a question, there's always sort of a war that's going on. I ask the question and I'm sort of putting another person on the defense. I'm putting truth on the defense. I'm saying, okay, prove yourself. Give me some type of insight here. But a good question, a big question, will always affect me just as much. It will challenge me just as much. Because see, here's John's 